questions. All right, this is case seven. A nine-year-old female with a nodule in the back. Clinically, they thought it was a lipoma versus a cyst. Um, if you've followed me online, you know I love to rant about that. Everything is a lipoma or a cyst clinically until it gets biopsied and it turns out to not be a lipoma or a cyst. So um, just a reminder that anything that's a deep nodule, um, doesn't matter what it's made of, it can look just like a nondescript skin colored bump clinically that would resemble a lipoma or cyst. So they did ultrasound on this though because of the size of it, I think. And it showed a well-defined complex mass with internal echogenicity and a vascular component. And on the differential on ultrasound was hemorrhage or hematoma versus abscess, but neoplasm can't be excluded. So they went and did a surgical excision, and unfortunately, the uh, lesion fragmented during surgical removal and drained fluid, um, uh, serous fluid contents and fat. So now what we have is this fragmented material here submitted for pathology. And I apologize for the little cut, um, the cut chatter lines here on the tissue, but this is the best section I had available. So... I hope you had a chance to take a look at this. It's uh, fragmented, but also it's very heterogeneous. We have, um, I think most notable, these cellular areas here that have fascicles that almost vaguely start to make kind of a herringbone pattern. And if we zoom in closer, you can see it's a range of kind of spindle to epithelioid cells with some pretty significant um, hyperchromatic pleomorphic atypia in the nuclei. There are multiple areas with uh, hemorrhage and extravasated erythrocytes uh, that appears to be potentially more than just a procedural change, but actually maybe some blood in the tumor or the lesional cells uh, themselves. And uh, if you look around, though, you can see that there are areas also with kind of sclerotic, almost almost keloidal-like collagen and uh, spindle to, to boomerang-shaped cells wrapping around the collagen. And I'm not just saying boomerang cells because of uh, an Australian audience. I promise I, I say that in, uh, in my practice when I'm teaching all the time. And maybe it's, maybe it's inappropriate, the uh, description. But these kind of, you know, angulated or triangle cells that wrap around uh, the background collagen. So uh, that's kind of interesting. And uh, other areas, let's look here. We can even see some, some bluish kind of mucin or mixoid background changes and loose uh, kind of wispy uh, arrangement of the cells. So quite a wide range of features here. Here's another slide that has more uh, mixoid area. And even you could think of almost a, a neural kind of appearance in, in some foci. So it's very heterogeneous. And here's a couple little round world nodules. And then there's this. We have big cystic spaces that seem to be more than just fragmentation uh, from the surgery, but actually maybe a cystic or pseudocystic component that was maybe present in the lesion inside the patient. And there's uh, blood and some fibrin in the center here. And that goes along, I think, with that idea of uh, kind of a, a co complexity that was described on the ultrasound. And also, we see pretty prominent inflammatory component around the outside. And this is a little bit dark stain and scan, but I'll tell you, these are all lymphocytes and uh, some plasma cells as well. So we have pretty brisk inflammation around the periphery embedded in this dense fibrous or sclerotic kind of pseudo capsule around the lesion. And on this slide, you can see more of the same. Dense inflammatory infiltrate around the outside, lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, uh, fibrous tissue and sclerosis, hemorrhage, su uh, pseudocystic spaces, and then uh, this wide variety of morphology, uh, spindled cell proliferation with um, areas showing some prominent atypia. And there were even, I think, in some of the inflammatory component, even some, some vague uh, germinal center formation. So I wonder, did you put together a differential or did you come up with the answer for what this is? Because it's kind of a rare bird and it's a tumor that's good to know about because it is, it has a wide range of morphologic features. Uh, and so uh, things like that can really confuse us sometimes when it's rare and has a wide morphologic uh, variation. So I'll tell you, this is a, an entity called angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma. And this tumor, despite the name, actually has nothing to do with uh, dermatofibroma, aka benign fibrous histiocytoma.
So it's frustrating. And in fact, when I sign these out in my report, I add a comment that says, this is a rare tumor of intermediate malignant potential that usually arises in kids or sometimes young adults. I've rarely seen it in older adults also. Um, and despite the name, it has nothing to do, it's totally unrelated to benign fibrous histiocytoma, open parentheses, dermatofibroma. And the reason I say that is back during my fellowship training with Sharon Weiss, I remember we saw a case of this and uh, um, the person who sent it in consultation called and was asking me about it. And it took me a few minutes to realize that their confusion was they were asking, why do we need to do all this excision and stuff? Because they thought it was just a variation of dermatofibroma. So uh, you could get this confused with aneurysmal fibrocysteocytoma, which is actually uh, the name for dermatofibroma with aneurysmal change, hemorrhage inside a big dermatofibroma, totally unrelated to this entity here, angiomatoid fibrocysteocytoma. So that's why I always call things dermatofibroma, comma, aneurysmal type, or, or fibrocysteocytoma slash dermatofibroma, comma, aneurysmal type, which is the dermatofibroma with blood-filled spaces. I make sure I word it that way so that no one ever confuses it with this rare tumor here, angiomatoid fibrocysteocytoma. And because this is rare enough, I always add that commentary on the end that, that explains what this is and what needs to be done. So these, the classic example, let me show you a classic example real quick. So you can, uh, you know, use that as your gold standard. And then you can kind of conceptually think about this weird one that we're looking at here. So to me, this is like the most classic gold standard example I've ever seen. And this is a subcutaneous nodule on the forearm of like an eight-year-old girl, I think. Um, and what we see are three components. So the triad, the classic triad for this tumor is a nodule that has a sheets of histiocytoid cells with kind of a syncytial arrangement. And then a central cystic area that usually has serum or blood and fibrin in the middle with variable amounts of hemosiderin. And then out at the periphery, there is a fibrous pseudocapsule with a thick band of lymphocytes and plasma cells. So that's the, the classic triad. Blood-filled cystic space surrounded by sheets of syncytial histiocytoid cells surrounded by a band of lymphocytes and plasma cells with a fibrous pseudocapsule, often occurring in the subcutis on the upper extremity of a child. That's like the perfect uh, textbook example if you were going to write a test question. So uh, this one, I'll post, I'll post all the slides from the meeting, including this one here, um, on my kikoxp.com account so that you can come back and review them later. And I'll send the links to all this and some other uh, goodies to the meeting organizer for them to uh, share with all of you. So burn this one in your brain, but remember that they don't all look like this. In fact, there's a wide range of features. And my, my friend Summer Bowman, um, along with Steve Billings, uh, they wrote a paper about uh, the wide range of morphologic features you can see in angiomatoid fibrocysteocytoma. I've seen ones that looked world and like perineurioma. I've seen ones that were prominent herringbone fascicles that looked like a synovial sarcoma and everything in between. Also, these tumors have a translocation, several different translocations, in fact. And I told you in CPC part one that translocation associated tumors don't usually have pleomorphism. Well, guess what? Angiomatoid fibrocysteocytoma breaks that rule and many others because here's scattered pleomorphism. So this is a notable exception to the rule about uh, not having pleomorphism in, in um, uh, translocation associated or fusion associated spindle cell tumors, okay? So there are three different fusions that have been described in this tumor, and the most common is EWSR1, the Ewing's gene fused with CREB, uh, uh, CREB um, 1. That's 90% of cases is uh, EWSR1, CREB1. And then you can also have EWSR1, ATF1, which is shocking to me because that's the same translocation you see in clear cell sarcoma of soft tissue, which doesn't look, stain, or act anything like angiomatoid fibrocysteocytoma, and yet it has the same molecular abnormality sometimes. Mind-blowing to me. And then also FUS ATF1 is an alternative. Uh, you know, EWSR1 and FUS are very similar genes, so they can kind of trade places in fusions sometimes. Okay, uh, what about immunohistochemistry? Uh, in this case, and I'm going to go back and forth between my library here, because I tried to load up all the slides and uh, my computer was not having it. 
Um, okay, you know what? I actually won't load them because they had trouble loading before. I'll just tell you, and they weren't real impressive. But th this case had patchy expression of Desmond and EMA. And about 50% of cases of angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma will have Desmond and or EMA expression. So you don't always have them and you don't always have both of them together. But if you see either of those in the setting of any of the things we just talked about, consider the possibility of angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma. This case also had ALK expression, which a few years ago people described, uh, uh, some authors described as being a um, uh, really common finding in angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma to see ALK immunohistochemical expression, but molecularly these tumors do not have fusion of the ALK gene. So kind of similar to that, that unusual case I showed you of cutaneous syncytial myoepithelioma in CPC part one, where the ALK fusion was negative by fish, but they were still ALK staining. So I actually find ALK a really helpful diagnostic tool by immunohistochemistry for angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma. So these tumors, what are they? They're, like I said, they're intermediate malignant potential. In the old days, people thought they were a, a variant of, of uh, malignant fibrous histiocytoma, which is the old school name, the obsolete old school name for undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. But now, then later people recognize that that, that is not actually, this is not actually related to a sarcoma. This tumor usually has indolent behavior. It can recur locally. It sometimes metastasizes the regional lymph nodes, but distant metastases or death from disease is very rare. So aggressive behavior is rare. Ideally, it's good to excise these with negative margins and to follow the patient. But the good thing to know is that most patients with this do very well. Okay, but they can sometimes develop regional lymph node metastases. All right. So a really great example of the wide variation you can see in angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma. And I've seen a couple of cases like this that were fragmented and blood filled and that, that where the tumor cells were where most of the stuff we were looking at looked like fibrosis, sclerosis, inflammation and blood, nonspecific reactive changes, but only focally you could see a spindle cell tumor component. So be on the lookout when you see blood and cystic change and brisk inflammation, especially in, the, in a child or young adult. Go looking and see if there's any atypia or areas that look like neoplastic spindle cells, not reactive, and then do some stains, EMA, Desmond, ALK, or you can just go straight to fish for EWSR1 and see if it's that. Because I saw one before where I was almost tricked into calling it reactive, and it turned it was in a young adult, actually, if I recall, on the foot. And I thought it was all just hemorrhage and maybe like a ruptured ganglion cyst with inflammation. And one of my uh, more astute colleagues said, I think it could be angiomatoid FH, and we did the fish, and it was positive. And I was ashamed, but it was a good lesson because now when I teach about this, I can share that shame with all of you so that you can see that it's easy to make this mistake in cases where the spindle cells aren't prominent. But here we had a big sheet of it in, in a different block. All right. Well, I said I was going fast, and here I've spent 13 minutes on uh, case number seven. Every time this seems to happen. Okay.